Who in this room or who listening online is like me and would consider yourself a procrastinator? Who else? Come on, put them up. Come on, this is, our, this is a public confession time. Who's our procrastinators here? Those of you who are also procrastinators, you'll raise your hand eventually. I get it, it's fine. <laughs> but I, I myself am fully confessing, I am really bad at procrastinating. My wife knows this very, very well, and I ask for forgiveness often. And it shows, it's shown in a wide variety of times in my life. But one of the ways that it showed the most was specifically when I was a younger child or before I graduated high school and went off to college, though there was plenty of procrastination that happened in college, believe me. But I know specifically what comes to my mind for me is when I was a lot younger and when I would be at home and my parents would go away for an evening, either on a date night or they would go to hang out with friends or they would be going and doing something else. And they would leave the infamous chore list. You know what I'm talking about? That list of chores, if you're a parent, you definitely know what I'm talking about. But what it is, is it's this, this list of different things that while their parents are away, is a list of chores of, of mopping or sweeping or dishes or laundry or to take out the trash. Uh, whatever that list looks like, the parents would give that to the children and they would go off for a few hours and the children were told to do it. I don't think I'm the only person in this room or listening who's ever received a chore list. And I also don't think I'm the only person listening who's received a chore list and waited until the last half hour before the parents came home to fulfill the chore list. You're running around the house. You're throwing clothes everywhere. You're, you're trying your best to wash all the dishes. Start the washer and dryer just so you know it's running and it looks like it's been going for a while, but that's really the first load. But you don't mention that. You do your best to make everything look like it's been done. You do your best to show oh, look, I've done all of these things. And I think that that shows us an interesting th reason for why many of us procrastinate. We don't procrastinate the things we enjoy doing. Those of you who are into football, you're not going to procrastinate watching the game after church. Those of you who enjoy reading, you're not going to procrastinate sitting down and getting a good book open and saying, oh, no, I'm going to, I'll wait till tomorrow to do what I actually want to do. We procrastinate on the things we don't want to do. We procrastinate on getting those chores done. We procrastinate on getting those finances figured out. We procrastinate on getting the car fixed. We procrastinate on getting some of these things done that need to happen, but that we really don't want to do them. And I want us to focus on that truth this morning. Because I think, and I would make the suggestion, that we procrastinate as Christians. That Christians, one of the biggest struggles in the Christian life is procrastinating on the things that God commands us to do. Because many times, we envision the commands that God gives us to do as a chore list. Many times we envision the things he tells us to do, the commands he gives us, even as things as simple as reading our scriptures or praying or being with, with, with church members. Many times we view that as a chore list. And I want us to look into that. And I want us to see, well, what are we supposed to be doing in the present? What's that chore list, if we could call it that for a moment, that God has given us? Because the truth of the matter is, the Bible tells us that Jesus, and just as one of, some of the songs showed us this morning, is that Jesus came to this earth at one point, and then he left. And he left us here for a reason. And this same Bible tells us that Jesus will one day come back. Allow me to use a silly illustration, but Jesus is out for the night, and we've got our chore list. Yes, it breaks down. I understand that. But stick with me for a moment. What is that chore list? And is it really a chore list? I want us to look at this question. And I think there's a passage of scripture that helps us look at this. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open them up to the book of Matthew. It's going to be the book of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 25. We're going to be in verses 14 through 30. The book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. 
And as you're turning there, allow me to catch you up with what's going on in the story. The book of Matthew is a book written by its, its namesake, a gentleman named Matthew, who was with Jesus Christ while he was on earth some 2,000 years ago. And this is his retelling of the ministry of Jesus Christ, what Je- when Jesus Christ came to this earth, what he did while he was on this earth, and when he left this earth. And when we get to the point of chapter 25, we've gone through a lot of the stories so far. Jesus has been born. Jesus has gone through a lot of his ministries. He's done several, several miracles. He's done several more teachings. He's shared difficult things, and the people there weren't fully understanding. And then we get to this point where it just seems to be becoming more and more of a climactic part of the narrative. In chapter 25, Jesus finds himself in the city of Jerusalem. And not just at any point, but specifically on what was called the week of the Passover. A very important celebration for the Jewish people then and for Jewish people now. And while he was there, he knew something that nobody at that point knew. Is that he was going to die. He tried telling people. He tried to communicate that with his disciples, but they didn't understand him. He tried to communicate that with the crowds, but they wouldn't believe him. They called him crazy. You name it. And so Jesus knows his death is imminent. And so in chapter 25, he decides to teach on a very important part, something very important that us as Christians need to know. He's teaching about what he calls the coming of the kingdom of heaven. You go, okay, what does that mean? We have oftentimes will call it the second coming, when Jesus will return. Just as I mentioned earlier, Jesus was here, Jesus did his ministry, Jesus went into heaven, and Jesus will come back. The Bible teaches us that. And here we have, and specifically Matthew chapter 25, we have three different little sections in chapter 25. And these are three individual teaching opportunities that Jesus has. He tells us three individual stories that teach us three different things that all have to do with Jesus coming back. We are going to focus on the second of the three. The first one, and for the record, all three of them are this sort of storytelling mode of teaching that Jesus, that is called parables. Jesus uses parables in this place to teach on the second coming. He uses parables all throughout his ministry. Now the question is, what's a parable? There's lots of different definitions out there, but there's a definition I have from a pastor friend of mine, and he defined parables as this. He said that a parable is a very ordinary story that uses what we can see to show us something about God, ourselves, and others. Let me just repeat that definition. A parable is a very ordinary story that uses what we can see to show us something about God, ourselves, and others. When we're reading scripture and we get to a parable, that when, as we're reading it, the parable can feel a little dry. It can feel a little, not, I guess, bland. And not to say that it's boring, but in some ways it kind of is. It's not talking about these epic tales It's not talking about these crazy journeys of heroes going and and conquering and slaying dragons to rescue the princess. That's not what a parable is. A parable talks about everyday life. But what it's doing is it's using familiar places, familiar settings to teach about unfamiliar things. Did you catch that? It teaches, it uses similar places, common places, places that the audience would understand well to teach on things the audience wouldn't understand well. The problem for us, though, is that these parables weren't necessarily written for us, because we're about 2,000 years late to the game. So these parables were written, Jesus said them to an audience then, and now, 2,000 years later, we have to understand what ordinary life looked like, which makes it difficult. But I believe that understanding what this story says And understanding its message can help us understand how we should be acting in the present while Jesus is away. So without further ado, let's jump into this parable. This parable, starting at verse 14 and going until verse 30, is called the parable of the talents. 
the parable of the talents. Some of you have heard this story before, some of you have heard this parable before, but allow me to bring you through this story, and then from that we can develop some applications for why it matters that we're taking this time in the first place. So, we start out in verse 14 of the parable of talents, and it mentions, Jesus specifically mentions, for it will be like. He talks about it. What is it? Again, if we look at the context, and we look back up at verse 1 of chapter 25, it says, the kingdom of heaven will be like. And then we go to verse 31, and it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. That's the connection. That's the connecting point between all three of these parables. These are all talking about the second coming, Jesus coming back to earth. And so he's using this to describe what that will look like. And the, the, the story that he sets is he talks about a man who goes on a journey, a man going on a journey for unknown reasons. We don't know why, and we're not meant to know why. But while he's leaving on this journey, he doesn't just leave his household just to do whatever. He gives him a chore list. And he specifically gives three servants a task. He gives three servants a task. He gives each and every one of these servants different amounts of what are called talents. Now, this is not talents as in abilities and singing and underwater basket weaving. Talents was a form of currency in the ancient world. To one of the servants, he gave five talents. To one of the servants, he gave two talents. And to one of the servants, he gave one talent. And then he left. And then he's gone for who knows how long. Now, what's a talent? A talent, you might have a little blurb on the bottom of your Bible that says a talent is equal to whatever denarii and blah, 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 and all these different words that, you don't, that, that are really weird. And it's, I can barely understand finances in the United States, let alone 2,000 years ago in the Roman world. And so with all of that, a talent, though it may not seem like much that one person received five talents, a talent based on a rough estimation equaled about 20 years of a normal laborer's wages. Think about that for a second. One guy got five talents. That's a hundred years of a normal laborer's wages. Put that into today's numbers. That is hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. That was just dropped onto this guy. Just out of nowhere. A talent, five talents sounds a little bit bigger now, doesn't it? And even the same for the guy with two talents and same for the guy with one talent. Thousands, tens of thousands of dollars just given to him. Master says, here it is. Work with this. And the master leaves. But notice also what the master, what Jesus says about this master. And he says it in verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To each according to his ability. That section, that blurb there is important. To each according to his ability. This master knew his servants well. He knew them. He knew them personally. He knew what they were capable of. He knew of their skills. He knew of their opportunities. He knew of their connections. He knew each of them individually. And he gave each of them a certain amount of talents according to their own ability. He knew the guy with five talents and said, this servant is incredible at what he does. He, is, he, is, he has several opportunities to make money off of this money, so I'm going to give him five. Then he gets to the guy with two talents, and he goes, okay. I know this guy. He's a great guy. I've known him for a while. He's, he's still getting there. He's got a little bit left to learn, but he still can make, he, he still has imp impressed me with what he's done. I'm going to give him two talents. See what he does with them. And then he gets to the third servant. He goes, well, he doesn't know a lot about this. And I don't know how much I want to give him a ton. So let's just give him one. Let's see what he does with one. And then he goes away. And we don't know how long he goes away. The parable doesn't mention that. But what it does is it mentions that the two servants went at once. It says that they went at once. In verse 16, they went at once and traded with them. 
verse 17 says the same thing. They, the one with two talents went at once, and they traded with them, and they made money. And both the servant with the five talents and the servant with the two talents doubled their profits. Which again, that's a lot of money. That's 200 years of hard work. 200 years of a yearly salary. That's incredible. And even the guy with two talents, he goes from two to four. Not as much, but still really good. Still, he did a fantastic job, and they bought, and they traded, and they went through this whole system. And, and, and for those of you who know more about business than I do, you know how difficult that looks. But they worked hard, and they doubled their profits. And then we get to the third servant. Verse 18, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Two types of business strategy, I suppose. Some guys that might be a little more risky, some guys that might be a little more cautious. We don't know at this point, though, why the third servant decided to go and hide the talent that his master gave him. And it causes us to speculate at this point. He could have been nervous, could have been lacking confidence, he could have been, he could have just not known what to do with it. We don't really know, but all we know is that he took his talent, and he put it in the ground, and he buried it. And then an unknown amount of time takes place, and it says the master returned. It says that he came and, in verse 19, he came and settled accounts with them. This master came back after who knows how long, doing who knows what, and the first thing he did, when you come home from a long trip, I don't know about you, but I go and I sleep. I go and I rest. I'm not, I'm not good at traveling, personally. I'm getting better at it, but I'm not good at it. And so as soon as I get back, I'm exhausted and I go to bed. I just go to sleep. But this master doesn't do that. He doesn't go and catch up with friends. He doesn't go and do something else. The first thing he does is he settles the accounts with the servants. He says, okay, I'm back. Come on, let's get the three guys together. Let's see what we did. The three guys come in suit. The first guy comes. Verse 20. He who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered for me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. There's some excitement in what he's saying. He's made progress. He's done hard work. And he wants, he's proud of what he's done. Not, not in an arrogant kind of way. Does he does look at what's happened. This is great. And the master's reply is honestly quite beautiful. Verse 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The story continues. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. Again. That joy that he feels at helping and serving his master. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. This tells us something interesting about the personality of the master. The master himself is not entirely concerned about making the progress. If he was, he would give a greater gift to the one that made ten talents. But you notice the response is the exact same between the one who received five and doubled and the one who received two and doubled. This master cares not about the gain. He cares about the faithfulness of his servants. Even if they're only able to do a little bit, they were faithful to what he asked them to do. And he rewards them. Well done. Good. And faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy 
of your master. At this point, this master's got to be feeling great. He's like, these guys, they're, they're remaining faithful to what I asked them. We're doing so well. This is awesome. Let's get to the third guy. And we get to the third master, to the third servant. Verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. The third servant responds in very interestingly because he doesn't respond out of joy. He doesn't respond out of feeling accomplished for what he's done. He responds with an accusation. He accuses this master of being a wicked and crooked businessman, taking somebody else's product, somebody else's crop, gathering where he scattered no seed. This is a challenge of the master's integrity. And it caused me personally to get very confused when I was reading the story. Is this master a wicked man? Is this master a bad business person? Is he crooked? Everything else in the story seems to indicate no. I mean, you look at the joy that the, servant, the first two servants had. You look at the love that he gave back to the first two servants of their faithfulness for him. And then this kind of comes out of nowhere and gives you a little bit of a, a literary slap in the face. And the story continues. Verse 26. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and you gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received what was my own with at least some interest. He continues in verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not a very good meeting with your boss, huh? Based on this response, this master, he goes and he says, you, you're accusing me of stealing? And it's a question mark. It's not an exclamation point. If it was an exclamation point, then it would be true that this master was a wicked businessman. But it's a question mark. It's a rhetorical statement. It's, you thought this was true? If you thought it was true, then you could have at least put the money in the bank. There was a banking system in this time where you could put it in and accrue interest. It's like what we, many people have and use here in the world today. It's not much different. But he says, at least if I was wicked... If you thought I was a bad man, then you should have been more afraid. You should have done something more than just leave it in the ground and for no one to see. For no one to be able to buy and to trade and to be used. You wicked and slothful servant. And he gives us this point at the end. For to everyone who has will more be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this ending is another confusing piece to the story. Because elsewhere in the New Testament, elsewhere in the teachings of Jesus, when he refers to something called the outer darkness, when he refers to something called weeping of gnashing of teeth, many times, in fact, most times that I could find, he was referring to what we call today as hell. 
place where those who do not have their sins paid for by the blood of Christ go to have their to be able to have their sins be paid for and God to remain just. And many commentators, as I looked into it, used this as a time to say that individuals, servants of the master, servants of God, can be unfaithful in what they did and therefore lose their salvation. That's what I saw in a number of different commentaries by well-regarded Christian individuals. But here we believe and we see elsewhere in Scripture that once you belong to God, once you have repented of your sins and, and, and you believe that Jesus came and died for your sins, you're saved. Your sins are paid for. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that that interpretation, we don't believe in that. We have scripture to support elsewhere. But here's what we do know. We know that this third servant was given a task. And this third servant did not look well at his master. Perhaps this third servant even saw this talent and this task to work with it. Perhaps he looked at it as a chore list. And you know what happens when we have a chore list. We wait until the very last second to get it done. But the difference between our chore list and making our parents happy and the, the commands that God has given us to do while he is away is that many times we know when our parents are going to come home. For the record, I'm not advocating not doing the chore list for your parents, kids. If they ask you to do something, do it. But we don't have that luxury of knowing when Jesus is going to come home, when Jesus is going to return to earth. And so one could imagine the servant was caught off guard. Now, there's a lot to dig into this story. There's a lot to do with this parable. And I don't have the ability to do all of it. But here's what the parable instructs us to do. Is that the parable instructs us and tells us that for every individual who believes in Jesus, who's repented of their sins, and Jesus has forgiven them of their sins and has given them the Spirit of God to be able to work in this life and, and serve God and share your faith with others, God has given all of us our own talents. Talents in reference to this, not talents in reference to singing and dancing and underwater basket weaving. God has given, if you are a Christian, God has given you your own set of talents. And it's not something to hold up above others. It's not something to say, I have five, you have two, ha, ha, ha. Because the Father knows us better than we know ourselves. And just as this master, back in verse 15, said that he gave them according to their own abilities, according to each one's own abilities, so does God know what you are going to go through in life. So does God know the difficulties that are going to happen, the opportunities that you have, the people you're going to run into, your hobbies, your desires, your fears, your concerns. God knows them better than you do. And God has given you opportunities. God has given you talents. And he's told you to use them in this time. He's told you to be active in this time. What that looks like depends on the individual. Though I want to say that for some of you who may be looking at life right now and saying, life is, there's so much happening right now. Life is overwhelming. Life is hurting. Life is painful. There is so much grief that I suffer through on a daily basis. And saying, I don't think I can get through this all. Know that God knows you. God knows you. God loves you. God cares for you. And God has given you the ability to get through those difficult circumstances. Not by your own strength. Don't hear that. Not by your own strength. 
but God has given you the opportunity to work through those difficult times in your life. And many times, the way to get through these difficult times is by relying on God for the strength that we do not have. So if you're hurting and you're overwhelmed, God gives to each according to his ability. And God has given you the tools to get through these difficult times so that you can remain faithful to him, even if those tools is just God. But this shows all of us that we all have something to be doing. We all have opportunities to be working in, to be serving others, to be sharing our faith with those who do not believe in Christ. And we have a task to be active. We can't be procrastinating this stuff. We can't be procrastinating with the talents that God has given us. This isn't a chore list. It's especially not a chore list because oftentimes we can look at God's commands and see them as one. I have to tell the truth. I thought it would better me if I, if I didn't this one time. I have to have integrity and love others. There's others I really don't love right now. Trusting in God's strength above our own. I don't know. I think I can get through this on my own. I think I can do this. God has put us all in our own unique places so that we need to be using the gifts that God has given us. We need to be active in what we are doing. Whether that's somebody working in a business, whether that's somebody working at home as a mother, whether that's somebody who, only ha who has a, a Bible study that they're over, whether it's somebody who's involved in a Bible study, whether it's somebody who, who works in a factory where there are no other Christians in sight, all of these are opportunities for you to use the talents that God has given you. If you walk away with one piece of application today, I want it to be this. I want you to look at your own life. This isn't something I can do. This isn't something I can accuse you of doing. This is between you and God. Look at your own life. Look at the opportunities you have. Look at the people you know. Look at the places you go to. Look at the opportunities to be able to serve God and further his kingdom by sharing the love of God with all around you. And if you were to take all of the opportunities you've had and all the times that you may have served God or not served God and put them down in front of you and the master comes home and he sees your talents... How would he respond to you? Would he respond to you with the wonderful words of, well done, good and faithful servant? Or did he respond to you with the words, you wicked and slothful servant? I don't know that answer for you. And I'm not telling you to do this for my own sake. I'm simply telling you this because all of us will face God at some point. All of us will face God at some point. And we all individually have to look at God and say, here's what I did. Here's what happened. Here's the opportunities you gave me and here's what I did with them. We all are going to do this. And my prayer is that all of us We'll be able to use those talents well. We'll be able to serve in the opportunities we've been given to serve. To the point that God will be able to look at us, all of us, and say those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of of your master. God's tasks for us are not chore lists. They're opportunities we have to enter into the joy of our master. And if God is your hope in life and death, and if you believe that God is, it is, O oh Lord, our God, praise the name forevermore. 
If you believe these things, then the greatest thing we can desire is those words from our God when he comes back. Well done, good and faithful servant. In our waiting, we must be working. We must be active. We must be using. We must not be procrastinating. As hard as it is. So that's what I leave you with. And perhaps some of you may be saying, well, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with those talents? That question we'll be able to answer next week. As we observe, sorry, yeah, got to leave you with that one. As we look into the next parable. But until then, I hope that all of us will be able to use the opportunities God has given us so that he will look at all of us, look at Calvary Baptist Church, look at all of us as individuals, and be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant.